I call upon Michael, Lord of the Light, to protect these souls who go forth this foul night on the eve of Christ Mass, in search of the hidden treasure on guidance from the Dark Lord's minions. Yeah, with sigil signs and incantation, protects these brave hunters from the demon's wrath and returns them safe. Come, model. By pact of fang and firelight's gleam, we tread where shadows twist and scream. With whispers sung in sulphur's breath, we shield ourselves from fang and death. Fare thee well, brave hunters, and I will return. Come first light. When George returned in the morning, two of the men were dead. The other one was unconscious. On this Christmas Eve, let's go back in 1715 Germany, where three men were about to undertake a dangerous and illegal pastime. They were going to go hunting for treasure with the aid of demons. In Jena, a German town of 5,000 inhabitants, George Heichler, tailor and owner of a local vineyard, got together with three other people, Hans Gebna, Hans Zena, and a student, Johann Weber. Georges believed there was treasure hidden in his vineyard, and he thought he knew this because of the ghost, the white woman. She showed up quite often in the vineyard, and in those times, a ghost was likely to indicate that there was treasure nearby. Now, George convinced the three that they only needed a few items to enable them to find the treasure with the aid of demons. They needed some spring root, a magic book. The magic book being Dr. Faustus' Infernal Compulsion. And there they would be able to summon treasure-keeping spirits who would guide them to where the treasure was. But when you enlist the aid of spirits to help you find treasure, you have to protect yourself. Treasure was quite often buried in those days because people didn't have banks, didn't have safes. So they used to hide their treasure. And then they would die and no one knew where it was or they would forget where it was, or they would lose the map that told them where it was. So people were always keen to go in search of treasure. And then they discovered that with the aid of demons, they could find the treasure quickly and with more accuracy. Unfortunately, there's always a price to be paid when you enlist demons to go treasure hunting. And that's why you have to protect yourself and make sure you're not exposed and you don't allow the demon to possess you. The other snag with treasure hunting with demons is, it's illegal. The king, the authority of the area, this was not allowed. But strangely, the king had his own treasure hunters, who also enlisted the help of demons. George took the three men down to a small uninhabited house that was on his vineyard where, near where the white woman used to appear and he thought that would be an ideal place for them to summon the demons it would keep them away from the big house they would summon the demon they would be pointed to where the treasure was and then George would be able to reap the reward paying off the three who were in his employ George quite wisely didn't go to the house he stayed at home and said to the guys, I'll see you in the morning. So the three men, the shepherd, the farmer, and the student went into the vineyard cottage. The student drew a tetragrammaton as a magical seal with white lead over the door. Then the men entered. They prayed. The student then, Johann Weber, drew a magic circle on the ceiling with his sword. 
They spread salt around the entrances to make sure that they couldn't be attacked once the demon had been summoned. They lit a small charcoal fire to keep themselves warm because it was a bitter night. It was December the 24th, the eve of Christ Mass. They spoke the words of the Tetragrammatron. They spoke the words of Jehovah and other names of God. They called Prince Och from the Kingdom of the Sons to send the spirit Nathaniel to their aid. At the end of this, this protective spell, Weber was supposed to recite the incantation from the book, Holland's Vang. Three times he was to do this. He only made one and then fell into a deep sleep. The next morning, George roused himself and decided to go down to the vineyard cottage to find out how the three men had got on. It was very quiet as he approached it. He opened the door. He found Weber passed out on the bench. The other two, Hans the farmer and Hans the shepherd, were dead. George had no option but to call the authorities. The police arrived. They took control of the situation. Georges was imprisoned for further interrogation. Weber was taken to a tavern. No hospitals in those days. Where they laid him out to see if he would recover. The two bodies were left there, awaiting the visiting circuit judge to be able to examine them and determine whether foul play had been involved or whether a demon had indeed been summoned, taking two souls as its payment. So, guardians of the dead were left to watch the two dead men, to make sure no one interfered with them, no one interfered with any evidence. So the three guardians were left in the house. They set a fire as well in order to keep warm. The following morning, the magistrate arrived and two of the men were dead. One was rambling. He said that a ghost had arrived in the form of a small boy. The ghost had rumbled into the house and slammed the door with a mighty thud. The two men that had died had red marks all over their body. Hans, the farmer, and Hans, the shepherd, also had red marks over their body. As did Johann Weber, the student, and the third guard who was still alive. The two hands were buried in January the 11th, 1716, under the Jena gallows. Johann Weber was perpetually relegated by his faculty from the university, and Georges, the vineyard owner, was expelled from the country for 10 years by the authorities. After the judicial investigation was over, there was disagreement about the cause of the death. And even the medical professionals that examined the bodies could not come to the conclusion. Because obviously one of the possible circumstances was that the men had succumbed to carbon monoxide poisoning. They had lit an open fire in a cottage in 1700s. Is it possible that the deadly carbon monoxide gas had killed two men, left the other unconscious? And the next night, when the guards were there, they again had lit a fire. Is it possible then that they again had succumbed to carbon monoxide poisoning, killing two of their party and leaving one rambling? But what then of the ghost? Because carbon monoxide isn't really an, an hallucinogen. It makes you sleepy. It binds to the hemoglobin in your blood in preference to oxygen. So you fall asleep and die. There aren't many reports of people seeing ghosts and raving about them. The red marks, carbon monoxide poisoning does make the skin flushed and people with it look incredibly healthy, even in death. But these red marks were in the form of stripes, like they'd been thrashed. So it's a strange method of dying. So the question then was, was it carbon monoxide poisoning or was a demon involved? Did a demon come through the first night and take the two men because they weren't ill-prepared 
and unable to defend themselves in that supernatural and paranormal realm. And then return the previous night to claim their lives of a further two. Was the white woman ghost? Was she involved? Who was this boy? This boy ghost that no one had mentioned? Was he the form that the demon had taken? We'll never know. Four people died that Christmas in Jena, in Germany, while hunting for treasure with demons. If you enjoyed this, please consider like, sharing and subscribing. It allows us to give you more of the same. Now, go and have a very merry Christmas Eve. Indulge yourself tomorrow. Don't think of any demons that may be lurking. Don't allow any demons in. Mm.